Eye of the Lynx by Thomas Ligotti I had been on our psychic frequency for some time, but other matters delayed our meeting in the flesh. During the frigid months of the past year I was a busy boy, and a naughty one. The relevant agencies had finally fixed on the type of companion I preferred, and warnings went out by word of mouth, or rather lips painted so shiny in certain shades, mostly blood red but also pallbearer black. The underground world in which I moved was on the alert, don't talk to strangers, and so on. That was not a problem, though. Such wariness just incited my impulses all the more, and increased the number of missing girls in gothic garb, as one journalistic source fatuously described my activities. Thus my meeting with her had been belated due to unscheduled distractions, or so I thought at the time. But now I was standing on the sidewalk right outside her place of business. The doorway to the crummy cinder block building was done up rather ineptly, like a castle with toothy merlons. I looked over at the traffic light bobbing in the winter wind that howled through every corner of that desolate part of town. It was amber going on red. I looked back at the door. It actually creaked when I opened it. Inside I was greeted by a reception committee of girls lounging in what looked like old church pews along the walls. The narrow vestibule in which I found myself scintillated with a reddish haze that seemed not so much light as electric vapor. In the far upper corner of this entranceway a closed-circuit camera was bearing down on us all, and I wondered how the camera's eye would translate that redly dyed room into the bluish hues of a security monitor. Not that it was any of my business. We might all be electronically meshed into a crazy purpurian tapestry, and that would have been just fine. A fair-haired girl in denim slacks and leather jacket stood up and approached me. In the present light her blonde locks looked more like tomato soup or greasy ketchup than fresh strawberry. She delivered a mechanical statement that began, Welcome to the House of Chains, and went on and on, spelling out various services and specific terms and finally concluding with a legal disclaimer to make sure I wasn't a member of the law enforcement community. Certainly not, I said. I was just reading a local tabloid and saw your ad, the one set in spiky gothic type like a page out of an old German Bible. I've come to the right place, haven't I? You sure have, I thought to myself. You sure have, echoed the blonde in the bloody moonlight that suffused that perverse establishment. What will it be tonight? I inwardly asked myself. What will it be tonight? she asked aloud. Do you see anything you like? we both asked me at the same time. From my expression and casual glances somewhere beyond the claustrophobic space of that tiny foyer, she could tell right away that I didn't see anything I liked. We were on the same infrared wavelength. Both of us stood there for a moment while she took a long sip from a can of iced tea. It was then that I realized the true reason I had taken my time getting to her. I was saving this girl for last because she was such a rare exemplar of her kind. She was no dabbler in darkness and degeneracy, but a real pro. Plus the intensity and focus of her romantic nature gave off a signal that I knew I wouldn't lose. On the outside she played tough, yet I could see through that to an underself who dreamed of persecutions and imperilments as glamorous as those of any gothic heroine. I could have unzipped myself and taken her right on the spot, but I'm glad I waited. She pushed a button next to an intercom on the wall behind her and turned her head to transmit some words. Their tone sounded like that of a boss giving orders to one of her underlings. Come and take over for me at the door, she said with authority. What irony that she was the supervisor of the place, the head mistress of a school for bad boys. 
She turned back my way and gave me the up and down with her violet eyes. And what did those eyes tell me? They told me of her life as she lived it in fantasy, a gothic tale of a baroness deprived of her title and inheritance by a big man with bushy eyebrows which he sometimes sprinkled with glitter. By her impoverishment, the glitter-browed man who came out of the forest one spring while she was in retreat at a Carmelite nunnery intended to force her into his arms, but the high-born lady would not succumb or not until she was ready, and now she spends much of her time haunting second-hand shops, trying to reclaim her aristocratic accoutrements and various articles of her wardrobe which were dispersed by her villainous suitor. So far she's done pretty well for herself, managing to assemble many of the items she had lost as a result of the machinations of an evil-hearted malefactor who would dominate her body and soul. Her collection includes several dresses and her favorite shade of monastic black. Each of them tapers severely under the bust line, while belling out below the waist. A bib-like bodice buttons in her ribs, ascending to her neck where a strip of dark velvet is seized by a pearl brooch. At her wrist, a frail chain from which dangles a heart-shaped locket a whirlpooling lock of golden hair inside. She wears gloves, of course, long and powdery pale, and torturous hats from a mad milliner with dependent veils like the fine cloth screen in a confessional. But she prefers her enveloping hoods, the ones that gather with innumerable folds at the shoulders of heavy capes lined in satin that shines like a black sun capes with deep pockets and generous inner pouches for secreting precious souvenirs, capes with silk strings that tie about her neck, capes with weighted hems which nonetheless flutter weightlessly in midnight gusts. She loves them dearly. Just so is she attired when the glitter-browed villain peers in her apartment window, accursing the casement and her dreams. What can she do but shrink with terror? Soon she is only doll size in a dark doll's costume. Quivering bones and feverish blood are the stuffings of this doll, its entrails tickled by fear's funereal plume. It flies to a corner of the room and cringes within enormous shadows, sometimes dreaming there throughout the night, of carriage wheels rioting in a lavender mist or a pearly fog, of nacreous fires twitching beyond the margins of country roads, of cliffs and stars. Then she awakes and pops a mint into her mouth from an unraveled roll on the nightstand, afterwards smoking half a cigarette before crawling out of bed and grimacing in the light of late afternoon. Come on, she said with both hands in her leather pockets and her loud heels led me out of that room where every face wore a fake blush. So you're going to give me the 98 cent tour? I asked my hostess. I'm from out of town. We don't have anything like this place where I come from. I'm going to get what I pay for, right? She smirked at me. Satisfaction guaranteed she said with an arrogance meant to keep under wraps her poignantly submissive nature. She moved in a couple of indecisive directions before guiding me toward some metal steps which clanged as we descended into a blur of crimson shadows, the vicious vapor trailing us, tagging along like an insanely devoted familiar. Surprisingly enough, there was a window in the vaguely institutional basement of the House of Chains. However, it was only a simulation made of empty panes beyond which was a painted landscape illuminated by a low-watt light bulb. Pictured were vast regions of sublime desolation towered over by mountains hulking in hazy twilight. In the distance loomed a castle that looked thoroughly foreboding. I felt a bit like a child standing before a display window at a department store model of Santa's workshop but I can't say it didn't create a mood. Nice painting, 
I said to my companion. Very creepy. My compliments to the artist. The artist is flattered, she said coldly. But there's not much else to see down here, if that's the kind of thing you're looking for. Just a couple of rooms reserved for special clients. If you want to see something creepy, go to the end of that hall and open the door on the right. I followed her instructions. On the door handle hung a rather large animal collar at the end of a chain leash. The chain jingled a little when I pushed open the door. The red light in the hallway barely allowed me to see inside, but there was little to see anyway except a small, empty room. Its floor was bare cement and there was straw laid down upon it. The smell was terrific. Well, she asked when I returned down the hallway. It's something at least, I answered, winking the subtlest possible wink. We just stood for a moment gazing at each other in a light the color of fresh meat. Then she led me back upstairs. Where did you say you're from? She asked as that noisy stairway amplified her footsteps into reverberant echoes that made it sound like we were traipsing through a castle hall. It's a real small place, I replied, about a hundred miles out state. It's not even on the maps. And you've never been to a place like this before? Uh-uh, never, I lied. Because some customers run amuck when they experience for real what they've only seen in magazines and movies, you know what I mean? I won't do anything like that, I promise. Okay then, let's go. We went. And there was much to see on the way. A Punch and Judy panorama with characters of all kinds as well as the occasional whacking stick. Each scene flipped by like a page in a depraved storybook. Locked doors were no obstacle for my eyes. Behind one, where every wall of the room was painted with heavy black bars from floor to ceiling, the Queen of Pain, riding crop raised high, sat atop her human horse. The animal looked hobbled and harnessed so it couldn't run but only lumber lamely around, with the queen growing out of its back like a Siamese twin, her royal blood and his beasts now flowing together, tributaries from distant worlds mingling in a hybrid harmony. The creature was panting heavily as the queen beat time upon its flanks with her stinging crop. Harder and harder she rode her steed before it finally pulled up, foaming and sweaty, Time to cool down, horsey. Behind another door, one with a swastika painted sloppily across its front, was a scene similar to the previous. Inside, some colored lights were angled down upon the floor, where a very small man, his hunchback possibly artificial, knelt with head bowed low. His hands were lost in a pair of enormous gloves with shapeless fingers, which lolled around like ten drunken jacks in the box. One of the fingers was trapped beneath the pointy toe of a high boot. See the funny clown, or rather jester, in a jingly cap. His ringed eyes patiently gazed upwards into the darkness, attentive to the hollow voice hurling abuse from on high. The voice was playing up the disparity between its proudly booted self and the humiliated freak upon the floor, contrasting its warrior's leaping delights with the fool's dragging sack of amusements. But couldn't the stooping hunchback be beautiful too? His eyes whispered with their elliptical mouths. But couldn't... Silence! Now the little fool was going to get it. Behind still another door, which had no distinguishing marks. A single candle glowed through red glass, just barely keeping the room out of total blackness. It was hard to tell how many were in there, more than a couple, less than a horde. They were all wearing the same gear, little zippers and big zippers like silver stitches scarring their outfits. One very little one had an eyelash caught in it. I could tell that much. 
For the rest of it, they might as well have been human shadows that merged softly with one another, proclaiming threats of ultimate mayhem and wielding oversized straight razors. But though these glimmering blades were always potently poised, they never came down. It was only make-believe, just like everything else I had seen. The next door, and for me the last, was at the end of an exhausting climb in what must have been a tower. Here's where you get your money's worth, mister, said my date for the night. I can always tell what my clients want, even if they don't know it themselves. Show me your worst, I said, eyeing the undersized door before us. The situation here was as transparent as the others, only this time it wasn't horses, pathetic clowns, or paranoid shadows. It was, in fact, a wicked witch and her puppet slave. The clumsy little creature had apparently behaved badly and been caught in the act. Now the witch was in the process of putting him back in line, croaking about what puppets should and should not be doing with their free time. She swept across the room draped in some kind of moth-eaten cloak she had taken from a hook on the wall, her face sunken into its abundant hood. Behind her a stained-glass window shone with all the excommunicated tints of corruption. By the light of this infernal rainbow of wrinkled cellophane, she collared the puppet and chained him to a formidable-looking stone wall, which buckled aluminum-like when he collapsed against it. She angled down her hooded face and whispered into his wooden ear, Do you know what I do with bad little puppets like you? She inquired. Do you? The puppet trembled a bit for show, staying in character for the time being. He might even have worked up some perspiration had he been made of flesh and not wood. I'll tell you what I do with puppets who've been naughty the witch continued half-sweetly. I make them touch the fire. I burn them from the legs up. Then, unexpectedly, the puppet smiled. And what will you do? the puppet asked. With all those old dresses, gloves, veils, and capes when I'm gone, what will you do in your low-rent castle with no one to stare, his brow of glittering silver, into the windows of your dreams. Perhaps the puppet was perspiring after all, for his brow was now glistening with tiny flecks of starlight. The witch stepped back and whipped off her hood, exposing the blonde hair beneath it. She wanted to know how I knew about all that stuff, which she had never divulged to anyone. She accused me of peeping Tomism, of breaking and entering, and of illicit curiosity in general. Let me out of these chains and I'll tell you everything, I said. Forget it, she answered. I'm going to get someone to throw you out of here. Then I'll just have to release myself. At these words, the manacles around my ankles, my wrists, and my throat opened by themselves, and the chains fell away. You can't pretend. I continued, that there isn't something familiar about me. After all we've meant to each other, after all we've done together, over and over and over. You see, I also know the desires of my clients, or so I might call them. Newscasters call them victims. They show their faces on television. I make them famous, though my part in their renown is a mystery to all. And mystery is what does it for you, is that not so? The thrill of not knowing what will happen next. But here it's all by the numbers. You've been cooped up in this silly place far too long. For someone like you that can be deadly. You've always known you were special, don't deny it. You've always believed that someday, and it was always just around the corner, wasn't it? Great things were going to happen, rapturous adventures that weren't quite clear, yet when they happened would be real, as real as the velvet embrace of your favorite cape, the one with the silver chain that draws together its curtain-like wings across your bosom, 
as real as the tall candles you light on stormy nights. You love those storms, don't you, with their chains of raindrops whipping against your windows. All that pandemonium drives you wild, and the enthralling cruelties you imagine visited upon you in the candlelight by the man with the spangled eyebrows, how they make you swoon so helplessly. But now you're in danger of losing everything you really love, which is why I showed up tonight. You've got to get out of this tacky sideshow. This is for Hicks. This is small time. You can do much better. I can take you places where the raging storms and brutal subjugations never end. Please don't back away from me. There's nowhere to go and your eyes tell me you want the same things I do. If you're worried about the hardships of traveling to strange faraway places, don't. You're almost there now. Just fall into my arms. Into my heart. Into... There. That was easy, wasn't it? Now she was inside of me with all the others. The prize possession in my gallery of frail little dolls with souls given over to wild wind nights and sadistic villains. How I love to play with them. After the assimilation, I retraced my steps up and down stairways and through corridors of scarlet darkness. Good night, everybody, I said to the girls in the reception room. Back out on the street, I paused to make sure she was securely incarcerated within me. In the early stages, there's always the possibility that a new internee will try to unzip me from inside, so to speak, and break out the front gate. She did, in fact, make an attempt to free herself. It wasn't serious, though. A drunk I passed on the sidewalk saw an arm shoot out at him from underneath my shirt, projecting chest high at a perfect right angle to the rest of me. He staggered over and with a jolly vigor shook the hand reaching blindly between the bars of its cage. Then he proceeded on his way and I proceeded on mine once I'd got her safely back into her fabulous prison, a captive of my heart in its infinite chambers. What times we will have together, she and I and all the rest. I can do with them as I please, and I am pleased to do much. But they won't have to endure my treatment forever. I'll be back on the road by first frost next year, needing more bodies to warm me. By then, the old ones will have melted like icicles in the dank bells of my castle home. In the meantime, I'll be keeping a keen eye out for those who walk this world in glad submission to gloom. As I strolled in good cheer from the House of Chains, the traffic light down that slummy street turned from amber to red a portent of things to come for my new flame and me, now one in flesh as well as in dreams.